Lord. Um, All right, let us pray. Father, we're thankful for uh, your word for us tonight, and we do have to deal with uh, church discipline uh, and what it means um, for us to have spiritual discipline in the church. This, of course, is crucial and important for all of us to know and to understand and to gather that uh, we are a body, but we are a body who belongs to Jesus, and Jesus has ordered his church. So we are to live in his order under those he has placed in authority, under his almighty authority, for he alone is King of kings and Lord of lords. We pray in the name of our King Jesus indeed. Amen. Okay, so we are um, going to cover uh, a little bit tonight um, some review because that's really what starts here. So as we uh, talked about the church a few weeks ago and then way back when we talked about uh, Christology uh, and the doctrine of Christ, uh, we wanted to establish a few things uh, regarding Jesus um, and his relationship to the church, uh, and that is namely that Jesus alone uh, is head of the church, that he is the king. He alone has authority, and under his authority, uh, we uh, function uh, in the church. So how we govern the church and how we oversee the the day-to-day operations of the members of the church are all under the authority of Jesus, right? And so we'll look at two uh, quick establishing texts here. Uh, The first one from Isaiah. Obviously, as Christians, we read this as a prophecy of Jesus. This for to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. On the, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end, and on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth uh, and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Right. So we... Uh, read Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, and we say, well, that sure sounds like Jesus, uh, and we believe that Isaiah uh, was foretelling the coming of the Messiah, coming of Jesus, uh, and Jesus indeed is the one who will be this king, who will reign over all the kingdom, not just David's kingdom, but over the kingdom uh, of all the earth, right, and the, the new heaven and the new earth, as we say in the Nicene Creed of his kingdom, there will be uh, no end. So Jesus uh, is king. He is the one with authority. So let's take a look uh, at another text on this front. Uh, And that is from Matthew 28. Very important passage, right? The Great Commission. We usually look starting in verse 19, but it's actually in verse 18 uh, where we'll find the text that we really need for this evening. Uh, And that is Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, right? So Jesus there is saying that he is the one who possesses all authority. So anything that we do in the church must be under the authority of Jesus, right? So anything we do in the church must be under the authority of Jesus and can only truly Right, can only truly be Christian if we are following the lead that Jesus has given us. Now, where do we go to look for his authority? Well, the first place that we look, of course, is the word of God. That's why we're opening the word of God here. But Jesus has also established leadership in the church. Right? And as Presbyterians, we clearly want to say through the elders of the church, Jesus has established leadership in the church under his own right, to mediate uh, the administration of the church, and that includes uh, church discipline. So let's take a look uh, at Westminster this evening. We are in chapter 30 today. Now, right away, uh, the modern English uh, has a horrible update of the uh, classic Westminster Confession of Faith. I cannot explain for the life of me why they made this decision. So originally, the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, titles this chapter censure of the church c-e-n-s-u-r-e censure right to censure somebody right not censor but censure somebody uh, would be to discipline them so the right word that you should have here at the top of this chapter it should say discipline by the church not condemnation condemnation is something else right in fact condemnation doesn't properly belong to the church Right? It belongs to Christ Jesus himself, right? To condemn somebody is not simply to pass judgment over them. It's not even to hand down punishment over them. To condemn somebody basically says you are beyond hope, 
you are beyond hope. Uh, and while we can talk about that in extreme cases of church discipline to remove somebody from the church, not even the Apostle Paul, in an extremely gross situation going on in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, believes that the person is beyond hope. In fact, the idea of church discipline is to try to gather that person back in once uh, the evil has been purged uh, from their midst. So if I was you, um, I would do what I did uh, in this chapter. Anytime you come across this word uh, condemnation, you should cross it out and, and instead fill in the word discipline. It is not as horrendous a uh, modern English update as when, remember way back in chapter two, they updated the word passion to the word emotions. And therefore we say God is without emotions. That's not true. It's bad update, right? We need to have a different word there, right? Passions here is either referring, remember to the juices or the inner fluids or appetites uh, of God. And we can, in, in essence, what we're trying to say either way and what the Westminster divines were getting at is that God is not moody, right? God doesn't change on emotional whim, right? He doesn't go this way or that way based on how he's feeling at the time. This is not quite as horrific as that, but it's still pretty bad. So cross out the word condemnation, write in the word discipline. Anytime you see it in this chapter, I think there's another one uh, a little in at the beginning of paragraph three, um, and it reads just much better uh, if you say discipline by the church. Right, discipline by the church. Okay, so let's look at paragraph one here. Uh, we already looked at some backing text for this, right? As king and head of uh, and head of his church, the Lord Jesus has directed the establishment of church government separate from civil authority, which is to be administered by officers of the church. Now we don't agree, right? In the Church of England at the time, they did not agree on exactly what you should call these church officers. Uh, we as Presbyterians are pretty clear, right? Our name implies that we believe that the officers uh, in charge of administering the church are actually the Presbyterials, the elders of the church, right? And so we would define the word officer clearly to be elder. Now, there are officers of the church uh, known as deacons, uh, and certainly they have a position to play. But when we're talking about church discipline, church discipline is something that is done by elders, right, in the Presbyterian system, right? So deacons uh, don't, do not get involved uh, in policy and they don't get involved uh, in the discipline of the church. That's not their role. That's not what they do. Their role is very important. It's very good that we have deacons in the church. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but it is differentiated from the elders. Uh, and most deacons probably would, are fine with that. They were saying, yeah, I don't want to, if I don't have to get involved in, in doing church discipline, I don't want to. I don't want to. So what we're um, establishing here, though, uh, in this text is clearly that Jesus alone has this authority, but he uh, calls under his authority those who he will give authority to to administer the governance of the church. Now, we also want to be clear that Christ alone is worthy uh, of these titles, right? Worthy of the title of king, worthy of the title of head. Right? And so in Colossians 1.18, for instance, one of the text cited below, we read, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, then everything he might be preeminent. So he is the head of the church. And the reason that he's the head of the church is because he is the one who's preexistent, right? He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And so he is the only one who can be the head of the church uh, and lead it well. So let's take a look at Ephesians. And in Ephesians uh, 1, uh, 22 and 23, we read this, and he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. That's God put all things under Jesus' feet, right? Just gets this a little confusing. Uh, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all, right? We looked at that text uh, in a different place before, but Jesus alone is worthy of these titles. And so as we look at these texts, we have to say, okay, Jesus alone is worthy uh, of the titles, and more importantly, Jesus himself, through his apostles, has appointed those who would lead his church, right? So the apostle Paul sends Titus to the island of Crete, and on Crete, he tells him first thing after his introduction, 
This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you, right? So right away, we understand that the way that the church is governing itself is largely based on the synagogue system, right? And so the synagogue system uh, sort of has these caretaker roles, right? Which we would consider something uh, like the elders today, right? So the rulers of the synagogue and the ruler of the synagogue is not the, the preacher, right? The preacher, uh, it was usually a pool of preachers uh, and they're different. Uh, the rule of the synagogue instead is the one who's taking care of the day-to-day -day affairs and is ensuring that everyone is living a good life, right? And so the elders, uh, especially the ruling elders, as we call them the Presbyterian system, uh, kind of fill in that role, right? And then there's this teaching office, which Paul will get at uh, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5. Let's take a look at that. Do I want to pull that? No, I don't. 1 Timothy 5, he will differentiate he will differentiate between uh, two kind of classes of elders, right? So he'll say, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching, right? So we have uh, a differentiation between uh, elders who rule uh, and elders who are involved in preaching and teaching. Not every elder is the preacher of the church, right? That seems to be a very early uh, Christian adaptation of the synagogue system. So in the synagogue system, uh, most men would have an opportunity to read the Torah and preach at some point. Uh, the early Christian uh, adaptation of this is probably with its Greco-Roman influence uh, moves away from that. And instead, you have certain um, preachers and teachers who seem to specialize, right? So they're a specialized class of elders. And then the Presbyterian system, we call these ones teaching elders, which is our name, our, our fancy name to say pastor, right? These are the pastor shepherds, right? The shepherd teachers, as Paul will say uh, in Ephesians uh, chapter four. Um, these are the shepherd teachers, all right? And Paul says the worthy of the double honor. We can talk about what double honor means, but given the context of verse 18, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when stretch out the grain and labor deserves its wages. Double honor clearly means uh, that from very early on, the preachers were being paid for their services. So anybody who argues, well, the early church didn't pay, you know, I get it. I had a kind of a culty group uh, in my last, con near my last congregation who believed that any church that paid their minister was uh, heretical. Uh, and they said, this is, it's just not in the Bible. And I said, well, have you read First Timothy? Because First Timothy is pretty clear that the church is paying its preachers uh, from very early on. It's a strange thing. People get weird ideas in their head about what the Bible says or doesn't say. Uh, and then they build an entire theology around that just because they didn't take into context uh, a, a lot of other verses in the Bible that would contradict their opinion. So in other words, you, that's called proof texting. When you use the Bible to prove what you want to say, so you'll find texts that you think uh, support your opinion, but then you disregard or interpret away texts that don't. So that's a problem. Okay. So the important thing here, though, is that elders were established uh, in the churches uh, in order to fulfill these roles. So they are going to rule over the church. That doesn't mean that they're going to reign like kings, but it means that they are going to rule as in measure out the faithfulness of the church. Right. And when the church, especially when the members of the church are failing and falling, uh, it is the elder's job to step in and intervene uh, in the form of church discipline. So that's the basic uh, idea of what we are dealing with tonight. So Christ has appointed these officers to lead. Um, we can see uh, Paul addressing elders like in Acts 20. I think that's cited below Acts 20, 17 to 18. Um, but these elders are specifically called to rule or called to lead or called to govern, right? And so we can find here, um, and uh, they will cite this uh, down below there in 1 Corinthians 12, right? Uh, we'll start in 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Very important. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administering in various kinds of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you the still more excellent way, right? So whatever the higher gifts are, then the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthians the higher gifts are not tongues, right? Not tongues. That's just one of his clear points here, right? So they're starting to try to create a hierarchy in the church 
and say that those who, who possess these gifts, specifically prophesying in tongues, right, because they're big and showy, they're spectacular uh, in the technical sense of that word. Uh, he's saying um, just because they're big and showy and when you do them, everybody says, oh, look at the big showy thing you're doing. Doesn't mean those are the higher gifts, right? He says there are lots of other gifts and these other kind of gifts are, are things that you need. But the more excellent way, of course, is love. Now, one of those gifts in the middle of this uh, is administering or what we would call leading, right? It's leading. Uh, and so this administering, right, we would, the Corinthians probably would have not thought very highly of it, but those who are called by God and gifted by the Holy Spirit to lead in the church should use their gifts appropriately. And when called upon, should accept office uh, to use their gifts appropriately. So uh, the, those who are called to govern the church, right, are hopefully, at least some of them are given, have the gift of administration or the gift of leadership, uh, and they are to use that gift in order to order the life of the local congregation. Um, and so what else do these uh, elders do? Well, they encourage good and admonish evil, as we find in Paul's letter. Um, oh, that's a different text here. Where did I go? Ah, oh, there we are. As we find in Paul's uh, first letter to the Thessalonians, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Right. We urge your brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Paul's telling them, look, all of you need to be about this work of discipline, right? In other words, of following Jesus, right? Disciple, discipline, same root, right? You're walking in the way of Jesus, and we need to be about admonishing, hey, what you're doing is not good, and encouraging what you're doing is good. Um, we're about to about the business of admonishing and encouraging, but those in particular who are over you, overseer is another term for elder. Paul uses inter, those two interchangeably in uh, Titus one, for instance, right? The overseer and the presbyterios, which are the same thing, we'll just call it the elder, right? Is over you. That one in particular has been given the task of admonishment, right? And admonishment right, is correction, right, it's saying not that way, this way, right, admonishment is correction, right, and so a lot of churches have ceased a long time ago, they ceased actually engaging in admonishment, uh, because it can make people uh, very uncomfortable. Now, it also needs to be said that, you know, and we can look at various texts for this, that the uh, church governance and the civil governance are not the same thing, right, so, for instance, Jesus says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and render unto God the things that are God, right? The church is not the state, right? Which is why the church says that we, why we are in the church are called to pray for the state, pray for the emperor, right? Pray for those in the civil government of, over you because the church is not civil government. Now, we have said earlier uh, in Westminster, right, in the chapter on the civil government, that indeed Christians can serve in the civil government, but we don't want our church governance to be the governance of the land any more than we want the state of Washington to be the governance over the church, right? We view these, remember, as separate spheres, right? Separate spheres. And we, we believe that which is proper to each should be given to each and they shouldn't be commingled, right? One way or the other. And remember, it, historically, the bad news uh, the really bad stuff happens not when the church gets too big for its britches, then you get the Reformation, but rather when the state starts to overreach into the church, that's when people die by the thousands, if not millions, depending on when it has happened, right? So the civil governance is distinct from the church governments. The king has to answer to somebody. We'll talk about that more later, right? And the church serves Christ, not the civil magistrate. Right, so we don't serve our county commissioners. We don't serve our governor. We don't serve our president. We serve Christ in the church. Right, one way, um, one way to think about the church is that it's an embassy of the kingdom of heaven. Right, it's an embassy of the kingdom of heaven, which is why we don't pay taxes. Um, it's an embassy of the. I do personally. That's something I get asked sometimes. Yeah, pastors have to pay income tax, but the church doesn't pay property or other taxes um, because it's an embassy. It's an embassy of the kingdom of heaven, right? We are 
emissaries from a different kingdom, not from the United States. Now, we as individuals are, most of us, I would imagine, citizens of the United States. But our church is uh, belongs to the kingdom of heaven, where our true citizenship lies. So we don't want to confuse these things. Uh, and this idea, so we're going to cover this uh, in the sermon uh, on Sunday, but this idea that the king has to answer to somebody. I was uh, listening to, um, I don't know what you call James Lindsay, public intellectual, I guess. Uh, and he was talking and he had been kind of an adamant atheist. He still is an atheist, but he says, I'm not a rabid one anymore. He says, because I would get annoyed when I hear people. He said, I used to get annoyed when I heard people in government, you know, like praying or invoking God or doing any of these things. I get very annoyed as somebody who doesn't believe in God. Says, but now I'm really thankful because I want to make sure that everybody who believes that they have power in this country has to answer to somebody, even if that somebody is God. Right. They have to answer to somebody. You have to be under somebody. The king has to answer to somebody. Right. Which is why in Deuteronomy, for instance, the king has to write out the law. He has to write the law out by hand because he has to understand that he is under, not over the law. It's why uh, Samuel places himself in a position over Saul, even because the man of God, Samuel, is over the civil magistrate, Saul. Uh, and we'll explore that a little bit more on Sunday. So that's uh, largely our introduction here uh, into uh, paragraph 30, so we can set the players down. Okay, so we have a church governance. It is not the civil authority. We don't want the civil authority getting involved in church governance, right? We don't want the civil authority coming in uh, and laying down uh, the hammer on people who have committed, um, say, for instance, the sin of heresy, right? Certainly, the Westminster Divines actually didn't really have that big a problem with that idea. But in the American context, as we'll see uh, next week, as we look at synods and councils, um, we completely uh, gutted the first, uh, actually, we eliminated the second paragraph of chapter 31 uh, and gutted and rewrote uh, the first one to remove the civil authority's role uh, in the matters of the church. We don't want the civil authority engaged uh, in, the, in, the, in the church, including in the process of discipline. Uh, so what that means is uh, if you have done something uh, truly heinous, right, in the church and out and in the world, um, then we would believe that there are two processes that need to happen simultaneously and separately from each other. Uh, one would be uh, any civil um, penalties that you have to pay, right? So let's say you've done something truly heinous, let's say you murdered somebody, then we would believe that there is indeed um, you need to go through the judicial, the civil judicial process, but you also need to go through the church discipline process, right? You need to be called out uh, and um, called to repent, uh, and we'll come down to the purposes of church government, uh, church discipline here in just uh, a little bit in paragraph three. So we believe those are separate processes, but they can be happening uh, simultaneously, right? We don't want right, the state getting involved in the church processes any more than the state wants church getting involved in the civil processes. So that's where we are. Okay, so let's talk about an issue that was really, really important in the 17th century that we don't think about at all anymore. Okay, and that is the Office of the Keys. Okay, so the Office of the Keys, uh, let's take a look here. Let's just get an introduction here. To these officers are committed the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which empower them to free people from the guilt of sin or to bind them to it, to close the kingdom of heaven to the unrepentant by the word and condemnation, to open the kingdom to repentant sinners by the ministry of the gospel and by withdrawing condemnation as the occasion demands. Okay, so the office of the keys uh, comes to us from Matthew chapter 16. Very important idea here coming from Matthew 16. And so we're going to read the whole of this uh, pericope, which begins in verse 13 and ends in verse 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea of Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Right? That's kind of 
thing that Jesus says to you, where you sit up straight in your, seat, in your seat, right? It's very important. And then he goes on in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to no one that he was the Christ, right? Because it's not time yet. Okay, so Simon, Simon Peter is told uh, by Jesus, right, that you are the rock, right, on which I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, right, and so this creates a bit of a debate in the 16th and 17th century between Catholics and Protestants, and Catholics continue to argue uh, that the meaning of this is that Peter is established here as the first pope, right, as the first among many, as the first among equals when it comes to the apostles, right, and that by um, apostolic succession, literally by the laying on of hands and the ordination of the one who will take his place. Uh, this succession of bishops uh, who have the, the seat or the authority of Peter uh, has been handed down throughout the ages. And so therefore it is the one who is on the sea of Peter, the sea of Rome specifically, as it will become to be known, uh, is the one who holds the keys, right? In other words, it's the Pope who has the keys, right? And therefore the apparatus of the magisterium beneath the Pope uh, who holds the keys. Right, so that's the Roman Catholic argument. Uh, the Protestant argument uh, is varied depending on Protestant, but it's generally something like this. Uh, Peter is a spokesman for all of the apostles. And while he specifically is the one who confessed Christ, it is not Peter in his person or even in his office that, that Jesus is commending, it's Peter's faith that he's commending, right? When he says, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. It's not Peter as a person because Peter very shortly is about to deny Christ. Rather, it's this faith of Peter that is the rock on which Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It referring to the church, not referring to Peter. Right, that's very clear in the Greek. Right, it is the church, not Peter. Right, and so Jesus isn't really giving Peter much authority, although he is an apostle and a very important one at that. Rather, he is saying it's the faith of Peter that really is the establishment of the church. Right, and if you build your your uh, faith, right, if your faith becomes the foundation, right, of the church, right, you are part of this foundation of the church then yes, indeed, the church will stand no matter even if hell itself shall, ri shall rise up and come to battle with the church. And so the office of the keys is not given to Peter specifically, but rather is given to the church and more specifically is given to the leaders of the church. Right? And so it will be, and the leaders of the church have an awesome responsibility, right? Because the keys of the kingdom of heaven really mean that those who are in authority in the church have the ability, right, to either open or close the kingdom of heaven to others, right? And so we would bind, uh, and those you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and those you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, right? So the, the office of the keys, it means the ability to tell somebody, yes, indeed, you are, that you are good, you are bound for heaven, right? You are righteous, you are redeemed in Jesus, right? Because it all comes from him. Uh, and to bind somebody would mean that indeed that heaven is closed for me. So why would somebody be bound? Well, largely someone would be bound uh, because someone would be bound because of sin, right? Some, some great sin has come up, right? Which has thrown their salvation um, in, into question, right? How could a Christian do something like this? Uh, Paul himself will tell um, the Corinthians who send somebody out of the church so that they can wander uh, in essence in the world uh, under the power of the devil until they can be admonished to the point where they would come back, right? So this loosing and binding is not meant, right, is not meant to give, you know, undue authority to the leadership of the church. It's to be used in the cases of church discipline. Right, it's to be used in the cases of church discipline. So Jesus gives the office of the keys to the apostles and through the apostles to the elders. It is the elders who make judgment regarding sin in the life of believers, right? To bind them to Satan so that they can be admonished or to loose them to Christ is up to the discipline of the eldership of the global church. 
So that eldership has to do things properly. Now, just in case you think, well, this is a very strange passage. It's a weird thing to build a whole theology on. Well, Jesus repeats the same idea in the Gospel of John to all of the apostles uh, in his resurrection appearance in chapter 20, verse 23. He then says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The same idea is given to all of the apostles, right? You can forgive and you can withhold forgiveness. Uh, and whatever you do on earth will be honored in heaven if you are acting under the authority of Jesus. So a little later in the Gospel of Matthew, though, we get into Matthew chapter 18, probably the foundational text for church discipline. Uh, and in Matthew 18, Jesus himself is going to give a way to exercise the office of the keys uh, that would keep with his own teaching. Okay, he'll say, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. He listens to you, you have gained your brother. Now, this idea of go and tell him is not, uh, it's in the present, uh, it's in the present active uh, voice. And, and so it's, it can be said, you need to go and do this one time, but the more usual use of that term would be, in essence, this is something you should keep doing. You keep doing this. You keep going and telling, hey, there's something between you and me. We need to settle this, right? You've done this horrible thing and it's impacted my life like this, right? And I want to forgive you, but we need to come to an accord here, right? We need to come to a place uh, where there is forgiveness, right? If he listens to you, great, you've gained your brother, right? So it's not, I, hey, I went and talked to him that one time, didn't work out. So now, you know, we, we got to, escalate things. No, you got to give a good faith effort to try to work things out, right? Oftentimes when you're in conflict with somebody and you try to go and work things out, the first time doesn't go so well, uh, but that doesn't mean you give up after one try, right? That happens a lot in church discipline. Things escalate too quickly um, when usually um, you can probably hammer things out on your own. The other thing that happens a lot in church discipline is somebody doesn't even do this and they come and tell the pastor or one of the elders, usually the pastor, uh, you need to go and take care of this because ah, I'm so mad at that person, I can't even talk to him. Uh, and my reply to that is, no, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you have to try to work this out. Now, if that person you know, has attempted to murder you, that's probably, you, know, you probably don't want to go over to their house or something like that. Um, there is a civil, you know, there's there's a, some common sense to apply to this. Um, but the act of forgiveness is your responsibility. That's what Jesus is trying to tell you. And remember, you're trying to gain your brother. So that's the impor other important word here that we have to keep in mind, right? The word there is brother. The idea there is this is an intra-Nicene conversation. So these are people ostensibly who are Christians, who are in the church, who share your values, who share your virtues, right? Who are all trying to walk in the way of Jesus, right? And so we should be seeking reconciliation with each other. Do not attempt this with people outside of the church, right? Because they don't necessarily share your values. They don't necessarily share your virtues and they are not trying to walk in the way of Jesus. If you attempt church discipline with people who are not actually Christians, then you're gonna fail. Uh, which is why we have to take membership pretty seriously uh, as Presbyterians. And we do take membership pretty seriously as Presbyterians, right? The elders, at uh, the session, the elders active on the session have zero authority over non-members. We can't discipline them in, at all. We can't. You just can't do it. You don't have a relationship. They have not voluntarily, which is part of our membership files in the EPC. They have not voluntarily placed themselves under the authority of the session. And you don't have, you don't have authority to do anything. All right? The only thing you can do with a non-member who has truly stepped out of line is you can tell them uh, we would like you not to return to church here. Most people think that that's too harsh and that's too far. And so usually what gets done is, um, oh yeah, nothing, nothing gets done and then things fester. So that's why the elders should be encouraging those who are attending the church to move toward membership and then carefully examine those uh, who are coming to the church for membership to see if indeed uh, they are Christians. Okay, 16. So let's say you've done that repeatedly, it still hasn't worked out. Okay, so if he does not listen, right? You tried, you tried, you tried again. Nothing seems to be getting through, right? There's denial, I didn't do anything, or there's, well, that's, that's like your opinion, man, you know, that kind of thing, right? He's not listening. 
Okay, so then take uh, one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses, right? So it's these are not necessarily elders, right? This isn't a handoff to the session and saying, okay, you go ahead and do this. Rather, this is um, saying you need two or three other people who know what's going on in the situation to come along and sit down and try to mediate this conversation a little bit, right? So, because we have to be able to establish things, saying it's like, look, we have this thing between us. We have this thing you've done to me, right? And we need to work it out. And these other people are coming along to say, yeah, you really did this. Yeah, you really did this thing. And it's really caused this rift. And we would like to see it healed too, right? So that's step two. Okay. So if he refuses to listen again, then he tell it to the church. That's when things escalate to the session, right? So the session as the authority in the church is the one that needs to take um, into account and deal with it then, right? It's not you stand up in the middle of worship and you shout out that this person has done this horrible thing. Rather, you bring it to the session and you say what this person has done. Um, and then you lay the charge before him. And since you have two or three witnesses that can establish the truth of your claim, and that's what your blank is going. Okay, so what happens if he refuses to listen to the church? Right. So let's say the church session has said, no, you, what you are doing is not good. You need to repent. This is the fruit worthy of repentance in your particular case that we would expect you to bear. They are going to apply some of the methods of church discipline to you, um, rebuke or um, exclusion from the table or even expulsion from the roles. Um, they're going to do those things to you. Right, and so they're going to do that, um, and then the person still doesn't repent, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, right, as somebody who's outside of the church, right, who's just a sinner who needs to be converted, right, that's what Gentiles and tax collectors need, right, we don't treat this person as if they are verboten, we treat this person as, uh, as sinners in need of a savior then. It says, truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth should be loose in heaven, right? So you follow this church discipline process, and then you understand how you're exercising the office of the keys. It's a careful and deliberate process. It says, again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, right? He's referring to church discipline. This is not carte blanche. If two of us agree that I should have a Ferrari, that I should have a Ferrari, right? I talked to Tamara and the both of us agree and Lord, we're coming to let you know, right? That uh, I, I, I need a Mercedes Benz, my friend, I'll, I'll drive Porsches and I must make amends, right? A little chance, Jeff, we'll pray. Um, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about church discipline, right? So we're trying to say when we come to an accord, when we come to agreement that this is the best way forward, uh, then that will be done for you by your father in heaven. Right, for where two or three of you are gathered in my name, there am I among you. Right, we use that text out of context all of the time. Right, oh, well, there's two or three of us gathered, and here's Jesus with us. Jesus is talking about church discipline, <laughs> church discipline. So when you gather elders, right, or those witnesses with the one who's been offended, when you gather together, Jesus is saying, "Don't worry, I'm with you. I'm going to be there, right in the midst of you." right? You are not acting. You're not out in left field, right? You're not acting on your own accord. You are under my authority and under my leadership at that moment, right? So that's what church discipline is meant to be, right? It's the elders who judge if one is to be treated as a brother, an erring brother, or an unbeliever. That judgment is under the authority of the word of God, under the authority of Jesus, but will carry, um, but it will carry real discipline when appropriate. So we encourage faithfulness. We admonish sinfulness. The elders are not perfect themselves. The problem with church discipline is that it's always sinners disciplining other sinners. But the office carries real duty to, when needed, uh, even shut someone out of the kingdom on Christ's behalf. Right? To tell somebody you are no longer a member of the church. You are no longer a part of Christ's body. Most common tool to church discipline, though, is preaching, right? Preaching the word of God, right? Membership, joining and being part of the church is also a tool of discipline, right? We you know, admit into the church only those who we believe to be sincere Christians, right? And so that saves us a lot of headaches, right? Somebody comes in and says, I don't know, maybe I believe in Jesus. So, you know, like, well, that's probably not good, or 
Uh, well, I heard if I join the church, I get uh, to rent the, the sanctuary pretty cheap for my wedding, right? That doesn't happen as much anymore, but that used to happen all the time. <laughs> um, you know, and so the session needs to be very choosy about uh, who joins the church, right? You need to be choosy about who joins the church. Uh, now, one of our biggest problems with membership is that people who really ought to have joined the church are just like, well, I'm not sure I'm ready to make a commitment. Well, that's a problem, too. So disciplined members ought to be taken seriously by the elders and by the one being disciplined, right? And so if we take membership seriously uh, and we, you are receiving a good proclamation, good preaching from the word of God on a regular basis, and we take the word of God seriously, uh, then discipline can be had uh, and it can function uh, in the office of the keys. Okay, so let's, so we've established kind of what church discipline is and what it can do, but what's it for, right? What's the purpose of church discipline, right? And this is one of the things uh, we have to keep in mind. And one of the reasons why condemnation here at the beginning of paragraph three is a horrible way to understand, to update the word censure, right? It is not condemnation, it's discipline. So we're going to say discipline by the church is necessary in order to reclaim and regain spiritual brothers who have committed some serious offense, right? So the first use, the most important use, the primary use of church discipline is to reclaim and regain spiritual brothers, right? So this is in Jude 23 saying snatch some back from the fire. That's the idea there, right? It is reconciliation, redemption, restoration, reclamation, regaining, right? These words, right? R-E, right? The same prefix at the beginning. That's what the purpose of church, primary purpose of church discipline is, right? Is we're not trying to punish this person, but we're trying to get them to repent, trying to get them to turn from sin back to Christ and be reunited with the body of Christ, right? So number one, Number two, it's a deterrent to other sinners. So we say to deter others from committing similar offenses. Right? Similar to uh, some punishment in the civil law and church discipline, right? So we say, hey, this person, you know, was engaged in uh, sexual immorality and they were put out of the church, right? And that might make somebody else have a bit of a moment of pause and say, well, you know, I was thinking about doing the same thing and maybe that's not the best thing. Uh, for me to do, right? This is learning by negative examples. So let's take a look uh, at a passage that will address this. So yep, uh, I need to go down one more. Is that where I want to be? No. I got way down. Okay, 520. Here we are. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so that they may, so that the rest may stand in fear, right? So right there, scripture says it. Paul says to Timothy, Right, somebody is persisting in sin, they're not submitting to discipline. Remember, this is coming shortly after we're discussing elders, so that helps you understand what's going on. He'll say in 19, do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Right. So one of the things that can happen in church is we, you know, just throw accusations around, right? Well, that guy did this horrible thing, and you know, he's a he's a shoddy businessman and he ripped me off. It's like, okay, well, you maybe had a bad experience at a shop. Right. That doesn't mean that that's a church discipline matter. Right. But if you got a, you know, two or three members of the church who are all saying, hey, you know, that guy's, you know, he's he's coming out here and he's looking like he's this holy and great guy. And so we want to give him our business. And then we go over there and he rips us off. Right. He does shoddy work or he does this or he does that. Um, then that uh, rises to the point where that's a problem. Right. But what we're largely dealing with here uh, is this idea. Right, that if this person is going to persist in sin, even if it's an elder, then they need to be rebuked in front of everybody. Right, one because that's you know, almost in the public shaming. There's some discipline in that as well. Right, it's embarrassing, and we realize the weight of our sin sometimes in embarrassment. Uh, but two, it also tells other people, hey, don't do this. This is not the way you want to go. Right, don't go this way because if you go this way, there will be trouble. Right, there will be trouble. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, number three, and we'll jump back over to the confession. So we've dealt with to reclaim and regain spiritual brothers, to deter others from committing similar offenses. Number three, to purge that leaven which might contaminate the whole lump, right? To stop the part from infecting the whole, right? This is what's going on in 1 Corinthians 5. Now, I'm not gonna, we're, we're gonna be uploading this to YouTube. Children may watch this, so we're not gonna go into a lot of detail about what this guy has done. But suffice to say, 
it's gross. No matter how you cut it, it's gross. And the church is saying, oh, we're so spiritually enlightened and we have all of this grace. And so isn't it wonderful that we can live in such freedom where even this horrible thing can happen among us? And the Apostle Paul is like, no, no, not good, not good. What, you, what you're celebrating, right, what you're celebrating is licentiousness, and that's not good. You don't want to be a legalist either, but you don't want to be licentious. You don't want to pretend that, 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 that morality is now all of a sudden flexible. It's not. So what he says to them instead is your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven uh, leavens the whole lump, cleans out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened? For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Some people take this first out of context to say we must use unleavened bread in the Lord's Supper, because otherwise it's malice and evil that's in the bread. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is if you continue to let somebody who you know is persisting in, in this case, gross sin that is bringing dishonor to the church and bring dishonor to the name of Christ, right? This particular sin that the person is engaging in would have been recognized by even the pagans as sinful, right? Even the pagans would have said, what you're doing is not good. Right. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, you can't live this way. You can't do it this way. And if this person is among you, then that idea that you're going to try to live with sin and let it um, fester among you is going to begin to infect you all. In fact, he says, in essence, it already has because you're celebrating that which cannot be celebrated. And so the, bet, the only way you can do this uh, is you have to remove the infected portion. That the, you know, this is not just, you know, I got a hangnail. Oh, it really hurts. Maybe I'll cut my finger off. No, that'd be an overreaction. This is gangrene, right? It's rotting the whole body. And if that particular part is not removed, it will kill everything, right? It will kill everything, right? So that's what we're getting at here in the third purpose of church discipline, right? Is to protect the whole from the infection of the part. Okay, so number four, and we touched on this just a little bit, to vindicate the honor of Christ in the holy profession of the gospel. All right, so this is Jesus himself uh, saying, do not cast your pearls before swine or give to dogs what is holy. Strike that, reverse it. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you, right? So we are trying to uplift the honor of Christ, and so we're not going to allow the church to engage in such activities that bring dishonor to Christ and the proclamation of the gospel, because to do so would be foolishness, not only foolishness, but eventually it will turn and harm those seeking to do it. So vindicate the honor of Christ in the holy profession of the gospel, right, by upholding church discipline. What's the fifth purpose of uh, church discipline? It's to avoid the wrath of God. Right, to avoid the wrath of God, which might justly fall on the church, should it allow his covenant sacraments to be profaned by notorious and obstinate offenders. It's not that the whole sin, the whole church is sinful, but you have allowed obstinate and notorious offenders to fester among you. And so the infection has spread to the whole, and now the wrath of God falls on the whole. This is what's going on. We touched on this a little bit in our discussion of the Lord's Supper. This is kind of the bridge from sacramentology to church discipline. Uh, when in uh, chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, uh, we find out here in verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Why? Because you are mistreating each other, right? You're mistreating each other. Uh, and the evidence of your mistreatment of each other is the way that you have profaned uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, right? That's not, right? It's like, oh, you did the Lord's Supper wrong. And so now some of you are weak and ill and some have died. No, it's that that is the canary in the coal mine that the, what is going on in the body of uh, of the church in, in, in Corinth uh, is so bad that the wrath of God has fallen on them, right? So the wrath of God has fallen, and we need to understand that that um, it's to be avoided, and the way it's to be avoided is by practicing proper church discipline, by making sure that we are addressing sin on a one-on-one -on -one basis when it comes up, uh, and that we're escalating uh, as needed. Right? We don't expect most church discipline cases to be escalated all the way to formal pr proceedings. Right? We really don't 
expect that that's going to need to happen uh, very often. Instead, what we expect uh, is that most church discipline will be done individually, right? I will discipline myself under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. From time to time, I will have somebody intervene in my life and say, what you're doing is not good. Um, and then that will lead me in a different direction. Sometimes I will need a larger intervention and sometimes I, it will proceed to formal procedures uh, under the session. But that last one should happen very rarely, very rarely. Uh, and hopefully, you know, in the life of Parkway, not very often at all, um, because most of the times when you get into church discipline matters like that, it gets messy really fast. And a lot of people um, don't like it and they think that the session's overstepping their authority. But what I'm trying to establish for you here is this is one of the primary things that the session is called to do. Uh, and so we neglect it at our peril, but we don't, we also don't want to overuse uh, this tool uh, for discipline, which would be formal procedures, right, where we're just writing, you know, and so it's usually reserved for things um, that are persistent and consistent um, and that will damage the reputation of the church um, in the community and will damage the name of Christ, right, and, and the honor that is due to him, right, we don't want any of those things to happen, and so we usually have, and so things where we have to intervene uh, sort of are the worst the worst, right? So First Corinthians is a good case in point in that, right? In, in the thing that's going on in chapter five, again, I, there might be children watching this later, so I don't really want to get into it. Um, it is, even the community recognizes that this is sin, it's bad, and it needs to stop. Okay, so let's finish out here, right? And talk about how to accomplish these purposes. Okay, so what are the tools available uh, in church discipline, right? Since we are not, right, we're not part of the civil authority, right? We're not throwing people in jail. We're not putting them in the stocks, right? We're, we don't have any of that authority. We can't do any of those things. So what can the church do? What can the session actually uh, invoke uh, in its formal procedures of church discipline? Well, it can do three things. So let's get into it. Best way to accomplish this purpose purposes is for the officers of the church to act in accordance with the severity of the offense and the guilt of the offender. Okay, so number so the first thing we want, right, and if you want to understand what's going on, right, just like the punishment should fit the crime, the discipline should fit the sin and the sinner, right? The discipline should fit the sin and the sinner, right? You may even have two people who committed what amounts to the identical sin, but one of them will receive correction more easily than the other. And so you will use a different discipline method, right? This is part of, you know, that elders are shepherds, right? We are supposed to know our congregations. And so, you know, you don't apply more pressure than is needed uh, in church discipline to lead to what you really want. Remember is the first purpose is to reclaim and regain the spiritual brother. Okay, so the best way to accomplish this purpose Act in accordance with the severity of the offense, so, and the guilt of the offender, right? And so the first thing we can do is warn. This is known as admonishment or rebuke, right? We can admonish or rebuke the offender, right? We warn them, right, that what you are doing is headed for destruction. So we can find uh, a little bit of an example. It's not a great one uh, in First Timothy 5.12, and so incur condemnation by having abandoned their, well, let's go back a little bit. Little widow will be enrolled if she's not less than six years of age, having been the wife or husband, having a reputation for good works as she's brought up children and has shown hospitalities, watched a few of the saints, is cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to good works. But refused to enroll younger uh, widows when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry, and so incur condemnation by having abandoned their former faith. Right, so he's talking about what widows to enroll, and then he's saying, look, Younger widows have this habit of going off and getting married and abandoning their faith as a result. So don't enroll them, right? So warn them, right, when they want to do that, that that's bad, right? Besides, he says in verse 13, that they learned uh, to be idlers going about from house to house and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies. And we use the term Karen's for that, which of course with a daughter named Karen, it's pretty horrible uh, today. So I strongly encourage you not to use that phrase. Um, the church term for such people is busybodies, and it's a perfectly fine term, <laughs> and it describes what they're doing. 
They learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and all others, but also gossips, busy busy, saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, give the adversary no occasion for slander. Right. So here we are warning them. Right. We're warning them that what you, if you continue in this way, right, you're going to be a widow for the rest of your life. He says, no, don't do that. I'm warning you. That way lies trouble. Right. Why? Verse 15, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Right. So what we're talking about, um, and this is one of the things that uh, it's very difficult in churches, right, uh, is the Apostle Paul is saying that your family actually uh, should be caring for you. In fact, if you don't care for your family, he's going to say uh, elsewhere, uh, you're worse than a believer. Um, and so he's saying, look, the family has the first priority of caring for people. And only if there is not family available or they're completely and totally unable to care for you, that's when, you know, you need to have uh, the church step in. But the main thing here is he's warning young women, don't go this way. If you go that young widows, rather, don't go this way, because if you go this way, it's going to lead to destruction. Um, so don't do that. Right? So that's a warning somebody if you continue on this path it will lead to destruction so repent turn away from it um and go the right way right and so he's saying not this way right perpetual widowhood from a young woman's age right you are under the largesse of the church right the church has to now see pick up all of your expenses which is like they did in the early church um rather you should go and be married and have a family and manage a household and do all the things women did uh, in the first century all right so we warned the offender Right. Don't go that way. That way lies trouble. Okay. So let's say uh, the offense is worse or that that didn't work and you need to escalate things. And the second thing that you do uh, is you suspend them from the Lord's Supper. Right. So you exclude him from the sacrament of the Lord's Supper for a time. Um, there's not a good, clear example of this uh, in Scripture. It's certainly something we take from church history. Um, the citation that is often given um, is warning about idleness again. So we'll take a look at the top of it uh, here in verse six, and we'll jump down to verse 14 and 15. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of Lord Jesus, that you keep away from the brother who's walking in idleness, and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. So the idea there is uh, keeping him away means that you don't sit down in fellowship together at the table, right? You don't sit down and associate with this person in fellowship uh, at the table of the Lord. Okay, verse 14, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of the person, have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed, do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother, right? So there's your warning again, right? We're going to warn this person as a brother. We're not going to regard him as an enemy, but we're also going to have nothing to do with him. In other words, yes, you're a brother. Yes, we're going to warn you, but there's this extra step that we usually interpret here uh, as having something to do with um, not sharing the Lord's table uh, with this person. Okay. The final uh, discipline is exclusion from the church, what we often call excommunication, so, or excommunicating him from the church. That means you are no longer a member of the church. We have bound you from, um, we have bound you to Satan and excluded you from the church. You have to be readmitted into the membership of the church, right? And that only can happen through a process of repentance. And again, even excommunication is supposed to serve the purpose, is supposed to serve the purpose of getting this person to return to the church. So we come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll go down to verse 13 now. It says, um, I wrote to you in the letter, not, or verse 9 rather, not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Right? So he's talking about people in the church, not people outside of the church. Right, because he says, look, if you're going to get away from everyone who's sexually immoral or greedy or a swindler or an idolater, he says, well, you've got to leave this world because that's, that describes just about everybody. He says, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. There's the Lord's Supper. For what I have to do what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is not those inside the church whom, whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. And there it is. Purge the evil person from among you. Right? So what are we supposed to do with this one who has done this thing? We're supposed to put them in verse 5. Verses 4 and 5. When you assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord, Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. 
put this person outside, purge them from you, purge the evil, evil from your midst. The person's no longer a member of the church. The person's no longer uh, a member of the church. Uh, and so therefore they have to deal with church discipline. Uh, one more passage here, if I can get it to pull up. Um, every time I try, I've tried to pull this passage up, uh, Proclaim has crashed tonight. So this is the fourth time I'm trying. Hey, what do you know? The Spirit's with us. Okay. <laughs> Titus 3.10. As for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such person is warped and sinful, he is self-condemned. Right. So, and there in verse 11, we find out, actually, it's not the church that has placed condemnation on you. It is that person who has persisted in their sin warped and sinful that he is who has brought condemnation on himself and the church is merely pronouncing the discipline of exclusion or excommunication so those are the three methods of church discipline so uh, in our book of discipline for instance we still list that these are the only things that the church is allowed to do we can rebuke you uh, we can exclude you from the lord's table and we can put you out of the church right we can put you out of the church um, in the pastor's case, you know, those are just as true at the presbytery level as they are true of an individual member's case uh, at the session level. So that's church discipline. Uh, remember, its primary purpose, and I want to bring you back to this because it can be lost in the midst of this, is to reclaim and regain spiritual brothers. But that's it, right? Even the horrible situation going on in 1 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul says the whole idea here is we're, we're trying to, to save this one who has done this horrible thing, not to destroy, right? Not to destroy, but the church has authority because Jesus has given the church authority to practice church discipline. It's out of fashion, it's not things most churches are involved in now. We've abandoned, abandoned it largely in the free and non-denominational world. Church discipline is just not something they think about. But as Presbyterians, we have a long history of it, uh, and our confession certainly says that we are to do it because the word of God makes it clear that the office of the keys has been handed to the church and is exercised by the elders of the church. So therefore, we are to take the responsibility seriously, but all of us are to take the responsibility seriously of following Christ. And so therefore, we submit to Christ and we seek to follow him as Lord and Savior wherever he leads. And then Pastor Bill doesn't have to actually do church discipline because we are all being good, disciplined disciples of Jesus. At least that's my hope. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a difficult word tonight, but one that we need to hear. We need to take seriously discipline and discipleship, morality, and following in the way of Jesus. And when we take that seriously, when we listen seriously to your word, uh, then Lord, we will often discipline ourselves. And from time to time, we will need the help of a friend to point out what we cannot see. And may we receive rebuke and admonishment when it comes uh, with gentleness, uh, recognizing that the person is not trying to harm us, but rather to rescue us from ourselves. But Father, we thank you that discipline begins with each one of us uh, and that we can see that the uh, interaction and the uh, intervention of our brothers and sisters in church discipline uh, is for our benefit and not for our harm. May we always remember that discipline is meant to regain, to restore, to redeem. Discipline is meant to gather us together and be reclaimed by Christ, who alone is the head of the church. We pray this in his beautiful name, the name of Jesus indeed.